afternoon. I want to hurry up because I know that you're all tired from being in the church. Thank you, sir. Uh, being in the church today. I want to take just this moment of time, oh, to express my gratefulness to Brother Demas Shakarian. Brother, it's never meet as Pentecost under the groups. There's too many differences. But there's one place where we have things in common under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where we have things in common. That's God's way for us to meet anyhow. And there's no other place that God promised to meet man only under the shed blood. I was thinking last night of our brother Oral Roberts when he made that wonderful statement here about out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of water. The great uh, how he brought that in about out of his belly, I believe he said, throw the flow of these rivers of water. Did you ever notice? It's rivers of one water. Rivers, plural, water, one. Not rivers of waters, but rivers of water, one spirit. By the same spirit, we're all baptized into the same body. Out of him flows the goodness and grace of God. And now, you California people, we will be in your state beginning next week, I believe, over there. And then on down through Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, on down until we start overseas. The Lord bless you greatly. I appreciate the little ladies that's played the music. These fine men that have met this new brother here, Brother Solomon King. I may say that wrong. I can think of King Solomon and just turn it around. <laughs> that was that day, and this is another king, too. <laughs> That's right. A son of a king, anyhow. That's right. A son of a king. Oh, I'm not a king, the king. When I look at this, it reminds me of down in Mexico here a few years ago, Mexico City. We were there one night. There'd been a blind man the night before come on the platform, totally blind for many years. I looked at his feet. I stand there with a good suit on, a pair of shoes. I looked at his, his blind, no shoes on, ragged trousers, standing out there in that rain for maybe 30,000 or more standing there in that rain, leaning against one another, no seats. Been there since early that morning, just waiting to get there that night. And there had been, uh, this blind man had received his sight. And the next night, uh, much about twice the size of this bench here, whatever we call it. But just on the platform was just ricks almost as high as what that curtain hangs. Of just old shawls and coats and, that the people had worn throwing up there. Just that we might touch it. Uh, that most all were Catholic, of course, there in Mexico City. And I got in being the first Protestant to ever come in under a military invitation. That was from General Valdez, our good friend, good full gospel businessman. I remember that night, there's a scream come from the outside. My son came to me and said, I've got at least 150 ushers or more standing there and they can't keep a little Spanish woman. She's got a dead baby died this morning. Said, they can't keep that woman out. Said, she'll climb over their backs and everything. And I said, well, I'll just reinforce it. He said, I haven't got nothing else to reinforce with. I said, give her a prayer card. He said, I haven't got one. They're all give out. I said, Brother Moore, you go pray for her. I said, because she don't know me. And I said, uh, you go pray for her. And I'm going to try to pray for this big rick of clothes just in a few moments. While I was standing there, I looked out over the audience like this. And before me was a little Mexican baby, no teeth, just smiling right out in front of me. I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. And they brought the little fella and the little lady come in, falling down with a crucifix in her hand. I told through a brother interpreter to have her stand up. And I said to Brother Moore, I don't know where this is it or not, but I seen a little baby standing out in front of me in a vision just now, smiling. She had under a little blue and white striped blanket, just soaking wet. It was just raining. It was about 10 o'clock at night. The baby had died that morning around 8 or 9 in the doctor's office with pneumonia. And so... She had been standing in the rain. Her hair was all down in her face. And, and she was a very lovely child. She looked to be probably her first baby in her early 20s. And the little fella died. And I just laid my hands over on it. And I said, Lord Jesus, I don't understand this. But according to that vision I seen him no more than said that, he kicked and screamed. <laughs> and the little fellow was alive. I had Brother Espinosa's. How many knows Espinosa's? Brother Espinosa's. He was the one who chased it down to the doctor's office, found that it's true, you see. That's right. The baby died that morning to sign the statement. And so now, he's the same God today if we could just have the same kind of faith in him. That's right. Our Heavenly Father, 
sent us that faith of that little Mexican woman today. She'd seen that little blind man healed the night before, stand out there with her baby in that cold, blowing wind, it took pneumonia, and the next morning early it died in the doctor's office. Her first thought come, if God can heal a blinded eyes, can reveal the secret of the heart, it's still the Word of God. For the Word of God discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. And she knew that he could discern the thoughts that was in her heart. She believed him. And that he could raise up Lazarus from the grave, and he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. She come. And you rewarded her, Lord, by giving her back her baby. It lives today, so far as we know. We thank thee for this. Bless us today, Father. Bless these people with these handkerchiefs and coats laying here also. And may your Holy Spirit come now and impart the word of God to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you have a meeting just in a few moments. Or five o'clock, I believe. And usually that wouldn't give me time to get started, but I'm... I've been converted from that, I think, now. I've tried hard this week. I had a sore throat. Maybe that was working together for good. I told the people the other day, I, I had me a hair piece, but I was ashamed to wear it because I hollered at the women so much about their hair. And I, I had my hair taken out by carbolic acid, and the other night they opened that door and a little air circulated through here, and I didn't think I was going to get back today. I said, if Oral Roberts is here, he can stand by, if he will. He hasn't showed yet, so I'll read the scripture, and you pray for me. St. Matthew, the 27th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. I wish to read, and I'll listen real close to the reading of the word, because my word is a man's word. It'll fail. His word can't fail. So now listen close as we read. And before, you, while you're turning, I'd like to announce that our brother, Old Roberts, is going to be down in um, Jerusalem also uh, next Friday night. So you all want to come? You say, Where? Um, somebody said Florida was a promised land. I guess I can call Tucson, <laughs> Jerusalem. Phoenix is in the valley, <laughs> see. And Jericho is just down the valley from Jerusalem. <laughs> I'll never get out of here like that, will I? <laughs> Brother Oral Roberts speaks next Friday night. I'm sure you'd all be glad to hear him. We'd be glad to have you down. 27th chapter, the 11th verse. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the Christ of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was of the chief, accused of the chief priests and elders, and of the and answered nothing, then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled. Now at the feast, the governor want to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a noble prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was cast down on the set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for a Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, what evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather the tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all 
the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. My subject today, if I should call it that for the next 30 minutes, is what shall we do with this Jesus called Christ? And then uh, I would like to say this also, Jesus on our hands. Now, I believe that the hour where our scene starts is along about daylight in Pilate's judgment hall. And it's one of the saddest times and one of the most uh, crucial times of all history is the saddest mistake the church ever made in its history. They had just made it. And now it's been thrown into the laps of the governor, the state, both church and state, because they were a people chosen of God, called to be his servants, and the nation was supposed to be controlled by God's laws. And the church had turned down their Messiah. Although he had been so well identified to them, they had chosen rather to stay with the tradition of the elders of that day than to believe the anointed, the vindicated word that God had promised them for hundreds of years to come. Did you notice it also prophesied that they'd be blinded? They couldn't understand this and how they'd be blinded, but they were. And they had made their great mistake. And this day they had made their final show of it. And now it's in the hands of the government. And now the government has to make its choice. The churches had already rejected him, though God had thoroughly proved that he was their Messiah. Now, I won't take just a few moments before we get down into this, to the text and so forth that I have notes I got written here about him. How could those people have failed to see that? One thing the scripture clearly says, they were blind. But it's hard to make them understand they're blind. Just as hard as it is today. When the Bible tells us that this generation is naked, miserable, poor, and blind, and don't know it. Now, that's the scripture. Now, you tell we American people that we're blind, we'll tell you right quick, you don't know what you're talking about. But I'm going to bring you to trial this afternoon. Find out whether we are blind or not. And we got Jesus on trial this afternoon and his blood on our hands. And now we want to see what we're going to do about it. Will we make the same rational mistake that they made then? Notice what happened. He had been clearly identified and fulfilled the office that God said he would fulfill as Messiah. There was no question about it. For he was born the way God said he'd be born. He was rejected the way God said he'd be rejected. He had proven himself to be the Messiah because the Messiah was God. Messiah means anointed one. And he was anointed with the, with the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelled in him. He wasn't just a prophet, yet he was a prophet. But he was more than a prophet. He was a God head bodily dwelling in a human being known as the Son of God. Amen. God the Father had overshadowed a virgin and created in her, blood, in her womb a blood cell that brought forth the Son of God which God tabernacled in. And he was identified to them as who he said he was, but he never did come right out and tell them, I am the Son of God. No, no. They have to believe that. He said, my works testify who I am. He commanded them to look in the scriptures and see what day they were living in. 
then they wouldn't know what he was. I think it would behoove us to do this as we see another exodus at hand. I think we should look and search the scriptures when we see things arise. We notice then that the church had made their decision that they wanted nothing to do with him. Why, when the word correctly identified him and his works vindicated that he was the Messiah. Such a horrible, crucial thing, mistake that that church made. And I wonder if it could be possible that we could make that same mistake. They had been given their last chance to see what he was and to accept it. Now, you won't always have the opportunity to accept what God sends. See, his patience finally runs out. And then you cross that line between grace and judgment. There's nothing left but judgment when God's patience finally runs out. But they had been given this opportunity. And it's seen him identify himself. Seen him at the well with the woman and told her that she had five husbands. Seen Nathaniel uh, come up to him after Philip had went and brought Nathaniel into his presence. And he spoke and told exactly who he was and where he come from. Told Simon Peter who his father was and what his name was. And they hadn't had a prophet for hundreds of years. And even that little prostitute woman recognized the word of God. She wasn't all mixed up in something. She, she would, her mind wasn't all what we would call, if you excuse the expression from this, muddled up. Running here and running there. It was a virgin mind as far as that concerned. She said, we know the Messiah's coming and this is what he'll do. And he said, I'm he. And quickly she run, told the man in the city, come see him. This is the very Messiah. Why those educators and people of that day couldn't see that? It's, it's be hard to see if you wouldn't know the scriptures, but the scripture said they were blinded. They were actually blinded. But they chose rather, instead of that lovely Jesus, after uh, we hear the cry come out, crucify him. Pilate said, what will I do with this Jesus, which is called the Christ? They said, away with him, crucify him. Who shall I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus? And they made the rational mistake by choosing a murderer instead of life giver. One that was identified as life giver, they chose a murderer who was identified as life taker. What a contrast. And I wonder if I say this with all godly respects for my brethren and my sisters and for the men and women of this day who I preach to, with love in my heart for all people, I wonder if we are not about ready to see the same thing as is seen then. The government had become involved in this. And the, the issue was on. The question must be settled. It was at a showdown. So has it been today. So is it in this hour. The showdown is on. Something's got to be done. You've got to say yes or no. But remember, it won't be when you're forced to do it. You have to do it on your free moral will now. Amen. Now, not when that time Amen. takes place. When it does, it's over. Now, this may be the last day you'll have time to make choice. You can't do it then. You've already tucked it. It's too far at that time. You must do it now. Don't wait till the last minute because... Is the boat will pull out and leave you. The doors will be closed. Many people would have come into the ark if they could have gotten in there when the rain started falling. But the issue was made. The gospel was preached. The signs were showed. And the time was over. The rain was then falling. Judgment was on. Now, the whole nation had to reject it because that it was called, as we would say today, a Christian nation. Like this is called a Christian nation. Therefore, if it was called... Jehovah's nation, his selected people, then the whole nation had to turn him down. The church had already turned him down. The church had kicked him out. They wanted nothing to do with him. But now the government's involved in it. So is it back again. It's right back in the lap again. With the scriptures laying here identified just exactly what Jesus said would happen. Why do we stagger on in this hours of darkness? Why do we let this come upon us when we've been thoroughly warned? 
Just as it was in the days of Lot, we see the very same thing Jehovah has set the scene and told us as it was in the days of Lot. You see the messengers out down there in the Babylon trying to get Lot out? And you see the message to the elect, Abraham, it was already out. And everything exactly to name, place, and time has been thoroughly identified. But now it's in the hands of the government. The government's got to condemn it now. And they're going to do it. Don't you worry about that. It's a Christian nation. It's got to take its Christian stand. If it is, the showdown is on. The whole nation had to be brought into judgment because it happened about A.D. 70 when the great uh, Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem about A.D. 70 with his army from Rome and there they paid the price for rejecting him. Today... As we look upon that trial there, and we go out here and impersonate it in different ways of trials on Good Friday and talk about it and things, and the very same thing that we are talking about happened on that Good Friday is right under our noses today. And our elders are doing the same thing they did. Taking it right in on a similar trial after a similar promised word of this day has been vindicated just the same as it was vindicated there. Yes. Jesus, a common carpenter's boy, so thought. He was the word of God made manifest. And he was thoroughly identified because the works of God had manifested themselves through him and proved that he was the Messiah. The day that similar cases come again when the Holy Spirit has come upon us in the last days and identified Himself right in our church and has proven the same works that He did when He was sharing the fullness upon Jesus Christ. He did the same thing upon the bride. Doing the same thing and still we want to get rid of it. Remember, these are tapes that's made now that goes over the world. Not only to Phoenix, sure, I'm speaking to half of the world at this time. Because we've got a tape business that goes around the world. Notice, today we have a similar trial. After the same identified word. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. St. John 14, 12. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Matthew 28. All the world preach the gospel to every creature. Lo, a little while the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you even in you to the end of the age. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. They have chosen today not only a murder, but a murder of the word. A satellite to the very first murder. When the apostles was preaching the gospel and come down to Irenaeus and many of the great reformers and founders back in the early age. They come to Nicaea one time for a showdown. And they decided to make a universal church. To force people to come under their jurisdiction. Many who's read the history there knows many old prophets come there with animal skin wrapped around them. Eating only herbs and things. And they tried to hold out for that word. Hold for the word of God. But what did they do that 15 days of bloody politics? They finally decided to make a universal church and grasp some paganism with Christianity and set it out as a universal church. And today the Protestants are throwing themselves together in the ecumenical council doing the same thing, grafting in tradition of man and instead of taking the word of God which is thoroughly identified by the Holy Ghost that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every church stands in the balance today and is found wanting. You're back in Pilate's judgment hall. Yes, sir. What does it do? It's making an image unto the beast. It's a satellite unto Rome. When the ecumenical counselor is forcing and will force every Protestant denomination into it, and it practically all is there now. Full gospel and all. The hour is going to come when they'll have to come or stay out. And at that time when that force comes, you've already identified yourself with the mark of the beast. Oh, that's exactly what is it? A Protestant harlot with the old mother Rome the whore. 
Revelation 17 said she was a mother of harlots. Exactly. Protestant denominations holding out in her hand the cup of the wrath of, the, of God for her toast, her testimony. This is what we believe in each one. This is what we believe. Here's what the church is to believe. The word of God and let every man's word be a lie. That's what it's supposed to be. But we bring Christ again to that great crucial hour that he stood in in Pilate's judgment hall. Pathetically, a little bunch pushed off to one side with a bowed head. Other denominations rejected them, refused them, and turned them away and said, Have nothing to do with it. You better check up on the word. Now we find out this uh, ecumenical council is what's it doing? It, the Bible said, Does the Bible say about this? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Blind! Naked! Church goers! Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of the Holy Ghost, which identifies Jesus Christ to His Word. How can a man claim to have the Holy Spirit and deny the very Word, which is the Holy Spirit? How can a man do that? His own testimony gives witness that he's not what he's supposed to be. Committing spiritual fornications, denying the power of God. Paul said in 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, that's what it would be. He said, be heady, high-minded. I've got a doctor's degree, a Ph.D., a LLD. To me, that's further from God than he was when you started. Yes, that only takes you away from God. Don't bring you to God. The only one thing can draw you to God, and that's the Holy Spirit by His Word. The Holy Spirit is a compass. The North Star is the Word. And the compass will only point to the North Star. And the Holy Ghost will only point you to the Word. Not Amen. some ecumenical move. Not some denomination. Amen. But to the Word of God. Amen. You remember all the other stars shift with the world. But the North Star stays exactly because it's in the center. And every other man's Word will fail. But God's Word can't fail. It's a North Star centered. It won't shift with the world. No matter where the world is, it remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He is the Word. Brother and sister, I plead you in Jesus' name to consider this. You believe me in what I've said in these years. If God has proved what I've said has been the truth, not me. It's been His Word that's done it. Then I plead you in Jesus' name to check on this. Don't be blind to these things. It's right upon you. And remember the Bible said in Matthew 24, 24, that all whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the earth would take this mark. Amen. Only the elected who's ordained to see it will see it. The rest of them are missing a million miles. We see this big move set up now. Satan's big machinery set in order. The only thing it needs is it's got the mechanics that are only waiting for its dynamics to put it in force. The moves all congregation, a big council and thing. The big machine sitting there, but they're waiting for the hour when the lead goes down and then they can make it and force it. Make it a law. Look at the broadcast and things we hear today over the radio and the newspapers. Why, it's right on you now. We haven't time to do nothing else but receive Jesus Christ. He's been thoroughly identified. Listen, we say about Satan's big machine up there ready to move. That's right, to crush down. But remember, God's little flock that believes the word. Its mechanics is ready too. It's ready for the dynamics to send it a fire with the Holy Ghost. Pray not, little flock, it's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. The Holy Ghost will strike a little church that's come out from the world. Women that wears long hair and has the right to prove they separate themselves from the... The Nazarite is one who what? A uh, one that separates himself from the Word of God. Not short, wearing painted faces, Jesse Bells calling themselves Christians. No, sir. Man so wishy-washy that'll stand for a denomination to hold on through their coattails of some Caesar or Herod instead of standing for the Word of God. But God's got loyal people, genuine flock of God who don't care what the world says. They believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, day, and forever. This is not popular. It makes you unpopular. But it's the truth. It's God's command for it to be done. And God will do it. God bless you. I don't mean to scold you, but to warn you. It's better be scorched than burned at any time. So take warning. 
the Holy Spirit speaks in these last days. All's written in the book for escaping. Now we find out the little flock is ready for the dynamics to move it up in the skies to escape all this tribulation. Someone said the other day when I was talking, said, Brother Bram, you don't believe then the church will go through the tribulation. I said, I believe the church will, but not the bride. The church will go through the tribulation. Yes, sir, but the bride's free from it. She'll go in the rapture in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. She'll be caught up to meet her Lord in the air for the wedding supper. She has nothing to go through any tribulation about. Her Lord has paid her price. We're so thankful for that. Yes, sir. After the rejection of both church and nation, there was only one cry come. The next move was get rid of it. That's the next cry we have. The church has firmly turned down the Holy Spirit. We know it has. All members has come out of everything. That's a great call. Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran. But the church itself, the denomination, it cannot move. No, sir, it's already denominated. What's the thing of it is now? Crucified. Crucify what? Crucifying afresh. What? The vindicated word to be the truth. God's word crucified the flesh. Just as Eve corrupted the whole physical world by rejecting one little bit of God's word, so has the church did the same thing. You may say to me, Brother Branham, you got the wrong interpretation of it. Well, that's to your opinion. God don't need any interpreter. God's his own interpreter. That's what the trouble of it is today. We got too many man-made interpreters. God can interpret himself. His own vindication of his word is the interpretation. The Pharisees might have cried out too. We got the interpretation. The Sadducee says, we got it. But Jesus was the interpretation. Amen. The manifestation of God's revealed power promise is the vindication. Read the scriptures and see what the church is supposed to be today. Yes, sir. God don't need any interpreter. That's what they've done to Jesus. They found out back there that they thought he didn't have the interpretation. He was the interpretation. God didn't have to interpret it. Jesus' life interpreted it. He said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they that testify of me. And if I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. If the works that were spoke of this day don't manifest itself in me, he said, then don't believe it. Did they do it? God said a virgin shall conceive, and she did. Amen. You believe it? Amen. Certainly, but they didn't. A virgin shall conceive, and she did. It said the lame shall walk, the blind shall see, and what would take place? It proved they would do it. And Jesus was a manifestation. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. The word comes to the prophet, and the prophet, the word, is a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. When they see him doing that discernment, they said, this is Beelzebub, a fortune teller. That's no more than a name they pin on him the same thing today, called a holy roller or something like that. That's right. Though he needs no interpretation, he was the interpretation. God proved it by himself. Who is that sinful man today? Or who was that sinful man then? That would deny that the word wasn't interpreted. Jesus asked them, said, search the scriptures. They testify who I am. They are the interpretation. If my life doesn't interpretate what I'm talking about, then don't believe me. What sinful man could there be today that could look in the face of the Bible and see if the Holy Spirit isn't the interpreter of the word today, making himself known by manifestations of promises of the gifts and the things that he promised to do in this day. Malachi 4 being fulfilled. All the rest of scriptures being fulfilled. And see it right here at the end of the time. You don't need any man to interpret it. No, sir, it interprets itself. It proves it's the message of the hour. Repent and turn to God, all the world. You churches, repent and turn to God. Don't try to wash Him from your hands because you can't do it. The issue is right on now as it was then. He said, search the scriptures, they testify me. Jesus said, my works are my interpreter. He told Moses when he met him up there at the burning bush, he said, I am. I remember my promise. I remember that I take them people out by a mighty hand. I made the promise and I'm going with you. I'm sending you. You just be my mouthpiece and the signs will interpret whether I sent you or not. Hey, man, that's what men and women ought to look for today. A promise of another exodus. And an interpretation of God's word being made manifest. 
Trouble with that today, they say, well, my church don't believe this. What's the matter? You're living in a shadow of another age. Them churches were fine in their ages, but what about this age? This is another age. You never make Wesley believe on Luther, there wasn't sanctification. No, sir. You never make the Pentecostal believe on the Baptist or like that. Go back to that. They found something better. They lived in the light of their day, and today Pentecost has organized and set right down like they did. Exactly the same thing, and the Word's moving on, and it's moving right away from them. It's exactly right. Because we get so stiff and so starched, we let our churches get in any kind of condition. Go right on. As long as we got members, that's all that's necessary. Because we got more we ever had. We blow about that. Let me tell you something, some old proverb. That the devil counts his crowd, but God weighs his. That's true too yet today. God weighs you by his word. See if you're found wanting or not. I don't care about crowds, how many, how unpopular it is. It's God's word being made manifest for this hour. Exactly right. I don't care about crowds and who comes and who doesn't. It's God's words at stake like it was there in Pilate's judgment hall. Wait and see what we've found. Where we found wanting. Yes, sir. We believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. We find out that he told Moses that I'll be with you. And I'll just use your mouth. You go speak the words as I tell you. And the signs will interpret themselves. See, God don't need no interpreter. Oh, no, he mustn't be interpreter. God's interpreter proves himself. He said that he was the interpreter of his own word, and he is. He did it by Moses, and he does it today. We know him in the Bible as Elohim. Elohim is the all-sufficient one. He needs nobody's advice. He stands alone. He's God. And he is the word. And when the word promises something and makes it identified before you, what kind of an interpretation do you want outside of that? Oh, sinful man or woman, who are you that can rise up and say that it's wrong? When God with His Holy Spirit and promised Word interprets it in the face of every one of us. Who are we to say that it's wrong? Oh, sinful person, how can you do that? Sinful. What do you mean by that, Brother Branham? Unbelief. There's only one sin that's unbelief. Need not man still the interpretation? He interprets his own. I am the Lord. He said, I planted it. I'll water it day and night lest some should pluck it from my hand. He also said in another scripture that he watched over his word to perform it. Perform it, reveal it. To what? Is elected to those that is sent to see it. That's sent to see it, rather. He performs it to those who are sent to see, to see it. He watches over it, keeps it away from all these foolish carnal interpretations. These things that this is right and that's right and that's right. God's right. God's identified person. Well, then Pharisees could stood up and said, We're of God. We have the laws. We have this. And that stood the word itself. Amen. Said, Away with the crucified. It don't identify itself with what we believe, but it identified itself with the word. Amen. Hey, man, those who had eyes to see saw it. Those who were blind did not see it. Neither will they do it today. That's all. They're going done, seal themselves off, many of them. From away from it. Oh, yes. By fulfilling it, showing it to be true. Some say, I believe so much of it. Brother Branham, I can believe the Bible. I sympathize with the Bible. I'm a Bible sympathizer. I believe so and so. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But I just can't believe all of it. Because my denomination says it's not so. Then what kind of an interpreter you got? The same kind that Eve had. The devil. He tried to interpret the word to Eve. And he said, oh, this is right and that's right. But surely... Surely he's right. What God says, it's right. I don't care how much it seems to others. When God said it's going to happen, it's going to be that way. Would you use Eve's interpreter? Oh, sinful person, how could you do that? Yes, sir. They had got Eve's interpreter. The evidence, as I've said the other day, we try to place evidence. Luther said, believe and walk out. The devil believes too. Wesley said, shout, you got it. But he found out he didn't. Pentecost said, speak in tongues and you got it. They didn't. Christian science said, love, he got the fruit of the Spirit, but they haven't they denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. What is the evidence of it? When that Spirit that's in you can punctuate every promise with an amen, and God will confirm it. That's exactly the way it was with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, they had, they had more fruits of the Spirit. They had all kinds of evidences. You can't pin any evidence down to anything but God himself manifesting his word. That's the only true evidence that there is. 
that you're a Christian. How can you be a Christian when in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same God that was in David. He was the same one as in Moses. He was the same one that was in all the apostles. And he's the same one that was in Jesus Christ to manifest himself there for that promised word. And he's the same God today, the same word. Throwing light upon the word of the hour. God be merciful to us. Yes, sir. And believing God to interpret himself. Every word to be vindicated. Yes, he is his own interpreter. Brother, I think of the hour. I could stay on this a long time, but you got a meeting coming. I believe, and I'm going to say today, if we don't watch, he's on the hands of we Americans. Amen. Think of it. I say this not for anger. I say this for light. I say that the blood of Jesus Christ is on the hand of the American church today. The blood of Jesus Christ is on America whole. The blood of Jesus Christ is against the Methodists. Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostals. It's on the hands of all of us. Let's see if it is now. Think of it. The blood of Jesus Christ. Oh my. And it's Pilate that day. It reminds me of three ways that Pilate tried to get it off his hand. He tried all three ways to get it off his hand, but he failed. There's only one way you take it off your hand. Let's see what he did. Pilate tried these three ways and they all failed. We must face the issue. We know it's here. For his word has been identified by the scripture evidence. The word promised for the day is made flesh even to the evil part of refusing Jesus Christ and him in this latest sea and age on the outside of the church. We know that's the truth. Think of it. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son on our hands. You, that scares me to think of it. To run through him, it sends chills. To think the blood of Jesus Christ. When a man will watch his own fellow man's blood. One time in Chicago, not long ago, a friend of mine was standing there when one of the, the Dillinger outfit or whatever was shot out on the street. People were gathered up by the hundreds. And they stood all around. But they, what did they do? Where that blood was spread out on the street in that bullet hole, everybody walked around that blood. They wouldn't step in their fellow man's blood. Oh, no, sir. They're very suspicious of that. But they'll walk right through the blood of Jesus Christ. This old saying is still true. Fools will walk with hobnail shoes where angels fear to try. Right, they'll walk right over and say the days of miracles is past. That was all right for the apostles, but not for us. Oh, my, how can you say it? You're tramping under the foot the blood of Jesus Christ wherewith you were sanctified with. Oh, my, think of the blood on our hands. What a man's fellow's blood. I think about long ago, a few weeks ago, when we thought it couldn't happen in our nation. What about this fellow Oswald? Sitting there in that cell, sweating it out. If he's in his right mind. Now think of a man that would listen to this tape or sit in presence or anywhere and listen to the message of proving it. Sweating it out. Knowing that you've got to come to judgment and answer to the word of God. Answer to the blood of Jesus Christ, which you've been introduced to. On your hands. On our hands. Notice Oswald sitting there. What an awful thing it should, ought to have been to him or would have been. Or I guess it was when he thought that he would face an angry Supreme Court. With the anger of murdering their president, there would be no mercy. And he ever did take a get against him, it would be crammed against him. Fingerprints, gun place he was at, all would be brought before him. That's a mild thing to what it's going to be to people who set these meetings. Watch Jesus Christ rise in the form of his being and identify himself and you walk out without accepting it. Hold into some little creed or something that you call petty. That'll be a mild thing when you sit in the presence of angry God who's drank the, you have drank the blood of his own son and crucified him afresh in your mind. Swap your birthrights for popularity. It's going to be a terrible thing on that day. It'll be a horrible thought. How can you stand in a sweat cell? You natives in Africa, you in Australia, Sweden, Switzerland, you listen to this tape. How are you going to answer in the day of judgment when I've been in your nations and you've seen the identification of Jesus Christ rising among the people and proving himself? Sweat. My, you must have sweated out. 
Oh, how could he do it if he was in his right mind? What kind of an angry God do you think it'll be to those who have trod underfoot the Son of God and crucified him afresh again? Notice a pilot, when he gets ready to take a plane up, a pilot will take a plane out, he'll check everything before he leaves, every instrument. You go out on the runway and stand out there, check those wing flaps, check his gas catch, everything, every instrument he's got, he checks it over and over. Many of his flown in planes, and you know that's the truth. He checks every instrument. Why? He's got the blood of his fellow man up on his hands. He wants to be sure that everything possible is running right. How about a doctor in an operation? When he knows that he's going to operate, take a tumor or a heart or something other than operate on it. When he's going to operate on your body, he'll check your heart, he'll check your blood pressure, he'll check whether you got any cold, he'll check the antisex. He checks everything over and over and over again. Why? He don't want the blood of his fellow man up on his hand. And if a doctor and a pilot and so forth will check, how hard the church of Jesus Christ to do. When we see the things that we're living in today, we had better check. The blood of Jesus Christ might be left upon our hands. Now let's take one thing. Pilate's first scheme was, I find no fault in him. How that is amongst many of the fine groups today. I find no fault in the word. It's all right, but that was for the apostles. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say that Bible is all right. I believe they spoke in tongues. I believe they cast out devils. I believe they discerned the thoughts. I believe they were prophets. But not this day. Oh, Mr. Sinful Man, what's the matter with you? What happens when Matthew uh, 28, uh, 24, 24 lays right back, Hebrews 13, 8, flies right back in your lap again? Pilate, he couldn't wash it from his hands like that. No, sir, come right back in his lap again. So will it to every man. When you stood and seen God keep his promise, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How far to all the world, to every nation. Amen. To every nation. Go ye into all the world. It hasn't reached there yet. Preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. How are you going to wash that from your hands? You cannot do it. It's a vindicated and thrown right back in your lap. It backfires just like it did on Pilate. Oh, yes, sir. It comes right back to you again when you see the scripture identified right before you. Secondly, as we're closing. Secondly, we find out there was another way. As Pilate tried to do so to his people today, pass it on to his Herods and Caesars. Many fine ministers today, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostals, and so forth. A pass it on my headquarters is the one who won't let me do it. It backfired. It's backfiring again today. I'm not asking the assemblies of God, the oneness, the church of God, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian. I'm asking you as an individual, what do you do with the blood of Jesus Christ? What will we do with this anointed word of God that's right before us today? That we know is to be, is the Christ, the promise of the hour. What will you do with it? Not what your church does with it. Your Caesar, your Herod has nothing to do with it. That didn't excuse Pilate. No, sir. No, sir. Them Pharisees in that day said, Let his blood be upon us and our children. It is. Said exactly. What did Jesus tell them? You can discern the face of the skies, but you can't discern the signs of the time. No, I don't say this for Phoenix, but I say it for anywhere it wants to go to, you blind Pharisees. How can you spend in millions of dollars? You can discern communism, but the word of God has vindicated for the hour. You cannot discern. You're crucifying it again. You know all about communism. You know your Bible. You know the things got to happen. That's not interesting to me. I hate communism. I hate anything against God. But what my interest is is this: the church being ready for this hour, for the going away of the bride. Discern the face of the skies, but the signs of the time you cannot discern. And on his trial today is in the federal courts to make these 
council of churches and everything. You can discern uh, communism and all these things that preachers are preaching about and walking right over the signs of the time and call it a fanaticism. Call it mental telepathy or something like that and walking away and forbidding your people to come even here. If history has to repeat itself, I'm, my name's not William Branham. Exactly right. What's going to happen? It throws the blood of Jesus Christ right back on your hands and you're calling it an unclean spirit like they did then. All around the world. I guess you know what I meant then. Everywhere. Why'd you turn me down in Switzerland? Why did you do it? Finland. The blood's going to be up on your own hands. That's up on you. Not me. You never turn me down. You turn him down. Not me, because you said, I don't believe in such. The Word says such. There you are. Blind Pharisees, they can discern communism, discern all these things, but the hour they're living in, they can't discern it. That's exactly right. Now, it's about to reach its my final goal again. The crucial hour is here again. What is it? Crucify. We'll make, we can't all make them all Methodists. We can't make them all Baptists. We can't make them all oneness. We can't make them all Trinity. We can't make them all this, that, or the other. But we can have a council where you disagree as far as the East is from the West. And the whole thing's wrong. It's a satellite to Rome. That's exactly right. Isn't it? Now, as an individual, I'm going to ask you, what will you do with this anointed word, which is the Christ, the word that was promised for this day, you as an individual? Pilate never got it off his hands. You know that. He screamed, cried, and every scheme he could do, he failed to do it. There's a legend up in Switzerland there where a blue water washes up where he committed suicide. You know the history of it. He finally ran crazy, and he committed suicide. Why didn't he repent? He couldn't repent. No more than Esau could repent. He had done it. Don't you let that happen to you. He's on your hands. The works is done. The Bible's preached. The Holy Ghost has identified it. Amen. Amen. Any sinful man dare you to say it isn't so. The Holy Ghost in this last days. And the words that's been spoke said it would come to pass and here it is. Amen. Right before us. Don't try to do it. Don't let your end be like Pilate. No. He should have accepted him in his heart. That's the only way you can get him off your hands is take him in your heart. Oh, don't make that same mistake. Listen, Hebrews 10 says this. If we sin willfully, disbelieve willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. If you sin willfully after it's been identified to you and you turn it down, you are absolutely no chance of ever repenting. Just a moment. I got a note here I want to bring to you before closing. Like the spies on the road to the promised land. They was in an exodus coming out of Egypt. Come out by a promised word of God. God made his word known by a prophet. Moses sent him down there. He was identified that he was a God to bring him out under the conditions that he would promise to. The I am. When they come to the borderland, Kadesh Barnea, the great mistake they made when they got to the land and looked over into the promised land, they said, we can't take it. What was the other ten? They looked at the circumstances, their prestige they would lose. We're grasshoppers through the side of them, but Joshua and Caleb checked up. They went back to the word and the Lord said, I'll give you this land. It's a good land flowing with milk and honey. They didn't count what it looked like, what this was, and what this evidence was. God's word said, I'll give it to you. Go get it. And they were the only ones that went in. Oh, let us check the promises of God for today. That's right. Remember, we're in another exodus. A time, an exodus this time. Not into a promised land of the earth, but into the promised land of glory. Where there's no return no more. Glory to God, we're going to be there. Will you do it while we bow our heads? I'm going to ask this question while every man and woman is still. What will you do with this Jesus Call Christ. Will you accept Him? Will you take Him as your Savior? Will you be a... Or will you wash Him off your hands? 
Will you try to pass it on? Well, my, my creed doesn't say this. Or my denomination doesn't believe it just like that. It's right on your hands. You can't get away from it. What will you do with Jesus called Christ? His blood is on your hands since this week in the meeting. Let us pray. Lord Jesus. Help us just now in this hour. Let thy grace and mercy be with us. Let this congregation see, Lord, that thou art God, and there's none except thee. Let the power of God now, the word, identify itself in this people. That it might be known that you're God, and I've told the truth, Lord. I've done it. this at your command. As Elijah said long ago, I did this all at your command. Grant, Lord. That'll be so. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now with your heads bowed. Every one of you. The Holy Spirit just stopped me a few minutes ago when I started praying. He said there's some here that don't know that yet. May God of heaven leave you without anything. May he throw it right back in your lap today then. You sick people, sure, I've never done this at a businessman's meeting. You sick people here that believe God, that believe you have faith that touches garment. And you remember, the Bible said in Hebrews 4, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. We all know that. You believe it? Will you pray? Let not one person move from now on. Let everyone be real reverent, real quiet. Real quiet. Pray. May the Holy Ghost now lead us to what to do and what to say. For this crucial hour is your now against us. Lord Jesus, it's in your hands. I'm in your hands. I commit myself to you. Throw it back in their laps, Lord. Put it right back. Sure, your great Holy Spirit tells me here what's right and wrong. And I know this tape's going to meet many out there. I pray that you'll let it be known today. But I've told them the truth and I've been sent for this like you said on the river that time when that angel of the Lord stood there in that pillar of fire. Let it be known today that I've told the truth through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Raise your heads now. Look this away and don't you doubt. God Almighty be the judge of us. When Jesus Christ stood here on earth, when he died, he healed the sick. He saved the lost. Do you believe that? Amen. But when he's sure how they know he was because he was the word. How many knows that to be true? Amen. He was the word and the word deserves the thoughts that's in the heart. Is that right? Amen. I can't see a person in this building this time I know except these pastors and so forth back here. Or maybe Brother Roberts is here. I'll just have him start a prayer line. Is Brother Roberts back in there? He's not here. All right. My ministry will do for this time. I challenge you in the name of Jesus Christ to believe me that I've told the truth about the Word and believe that what I've said to be the truth. Will you do that? Amen. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. There's a man sitting right here. I want you to turn your eyes. Can't you see that light hanging there? There's a man sitting there looking at me praying. He's suffering with a lung trouble and weakness. Don't miss it, sir. Mr. Carr, raise up and accept your healing. Jesus Christ makes you well. Amen. I've never seen a man in my life. There's a man behind there, very fine. He was praying too. But what's the matter with that man? That man there has eye trouble. He's got a growth in his left side. His name is Mr. Bartlett. You believe. Is that right, sir? Am I a stranger? You wave your hand. We're all strangers. That's right. God bless you. Believe you'll be healed. You believe. What'd you tell him that far? You believe me to be his prophet, sir? Yes, sir. You're suffering with a spiritual upset. A little upset in business and saying, that's right, that's right. Mr. Carlson, you believe with all your heart that Jesus has straightened it out for you? Is that your name? That's your place? All right. You can have what you ask for. 
Amen. Somebody over here believe it. Amen. Somebody with genuine Holy Ghost faith. Miss Walroth. I see that. I know you. No, it isn't for you. It's for that baby. And that baby is your great grandson. I've never seen him in my life. That's the truth. The baby suffering with the eye trouble caused from an allergy he had. That's thus saith the Lord. You believe. Lady, you're very sick. You're nervous. Got a stomach trouble. Almost in a nervous breakdown. You believe that God will heal you? Mary, believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ will give you your desire. He's on your lap. There's a little lady sitting here praying, looking right at me. Heads down, raised up, look at me. Good person. You're not from here. You come from away from here. New York. But if you believe that Jesus Christ makes the well, he'll give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You believe that? Mrs. Bryan from New York. Believe with all your heart and you can receive the Holy Ghost right now. It's in your lap, friends. Do you believe it? The word making itself manifest. You believe Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever? I don't know these people. God's my judge. I don't know these people. Jesus Christ knows them. What will you do with this anointed word? As he said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. If this part's true, the message that I preach is true. It's the Holy Ghost itself doing its own interpreting that it's right. Amen. 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 Believe it with all your heart. Will you do it? Stand up on your feet then and accept it in the name of Jesus Christ. While the Holy Ghost is here, I'll lay hands upon these handkerchiefs here. Let's raise our hands to Christ. Lord Jesus, we believe you. We know you're the truth, the light, the word. I put my hands upon these handkerchiefs. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your power will circle through this building, through these handkerchiefs, over these little coats and cloaks. And may the Holy Ghost come upon them, Lord. Grant it. And may they be healed, every one of them, for thy word is true. Grant it, Lord. Now to everyone in the congregation, what will you do with this Jesus called Christ? It's on your hand. Don't you let the people tell you. I mean the people on this tape, the people out here in the audience. What will you do with it today? Why don't you accept him? Every sick man in here, every doubting man in here, every doubting woman, why don't you accept him as your Savior? You'll never wash him off your hand. Your creed will never take him off. There's not enough fuller soap in the country to move it. Only one thing you can do, get him in your heart. Amen. Will you accept it? Raise your hands and say, give him praise and glory. Heavenly Father, they are yours. Your word is identified. The people are yours. I commit them to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Raise up your hands. I am praising. And I commit him to you in Jesus Christ's name.